Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Amy Loving, and I will be your moderator today. Thank you all for tuning in to our webinar on warbler identification. Our presenter this morning is Jimmy Weebler, and he's an AmeriCorps naturalist at Nahant Marsh. For those of you who are not familiar, Nahant Marsh is uh, located in Southwest Davenport, Iowa, and we are a nonprofit. And the three main things that we do down there are provide environmental education, research, and restoration. Um, currently, we are not charging for webinars, but as a nonprofit, we rely heavily on donations. If you are able, please consider making a donation on our website. This webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with participants over the next few days. And um, without further ado, um, I will go ahead and introduce Jimmy and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So thank you. All right, hi everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining me today to talk about these notoriously difficult to identify but much loved uh, birds. So um, before I get started, um, I, I wanna plug, I'm gonna be doing bird hikes at Nahant Marsh here starting on the, on the last Saturday of May, which I think is May 30th without looking at a, ca a calendar. Um, and we're gonna be doing a bird hike then at, from eight o'clock to about 9.30 or so. Um, I can, we might bird longer depending on, you know, folks' interest and things like that, but we're gonna be doing a bird hike last Saturday of May and we'll be doing bird hikes every Saturday in June. And then we may be doing bird hikes after that, but um, those times and, and dates will be um, to be determined. So I hope you can join me for some of those. Um, but we're gonna talk today about uh, warblers. So we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce you, give you some tips and tricks on how to identify them. We'll talk about their sounds, the calls that they make, and I'll, I'll play those for you. Uh, just a quick heads up, if you are wearing headphones, um, you may, uh, want to adjust your volume down at least at the beginning uh, I don't want to you know blow anyone's eardrums out or anything we, we've tested the sound so it should be should be okay but just wanted to give you a warning there and uh, we're going to talk about habitat so what what kind of habitat these birds live in uh, what kind of are some characteristic behaviors and then what are the identifying characteristics what to look for uh, when you're looking at these birds and trying to figure out what they are and so uh, without further ado let's get let's get started so uh, warblers they're all in the family Perulidae. And so that's, that's their Latin name. And we, another name you might've heard them called is the wood warblers. So same thing, warblers, wood warblers, um, perulidae, perulid, 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 oh, I can't talk today, perulidae species. And um, so they're all in that same family. Um, it's kind of a, it's a, they're small and colorful birds. So they're about four inches long. So they're, there's varying sizes between them, but they're relatively small. Um, very, some can be colorful. You can see the pictures here we've got uh, chestnut sided American red star, a yellow warbler, but they're not all colorful. There's a there's a black and white warbler down there, um, so they don't necessarily always have color in them. Uh, it's a very diverse family, and there is about 114 different species of warblers, and those are going to be in North America and South America. Uh, but there's about 50 or more species in the U.S. alone, and there's about 35 of warblers that you can find in the Quad Cities area. And so we're not gonna talk about all those today. We're only gonna talk about about 20 of them, the most um, common ones. Um, but most of them are gonna be migratory. And we'll discuss a little bit about um, whether these are migrant only species or not. And I'll show you the range maps for these, for these species um, as we go. Uh, most of them are gonna be summering in Northern coniferous forests. So those are gonna be your evergreen forest up North. And they're going to winter in tropical rainforest in southern Mexico and uh, Central America, places like that. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about first on how, what to do before you even go out in the field. And the adage goes location, location, location. So it's really helpful to know what your species range is and what their migration pattern is before you even head into the field. And so getting out those, um, your phone applications or bird identification guides, and just, just kind of looking through those and figuring out what, what's even around in the area um, that you're gonna be, or whatever you know, time of year that you're gonna be out looking for these. Um, it's helpful to know beforehand um, before you go out there. So of course you can always find a bird, you know, if you don't know what, what species you're looking at, you can always try to go back to the field guides after the fact and, and try to identify them. But it's always easier to know what's around before you even go out in the field. And so um, there are multiple field guides available. These are some of my fav favorites. Um, the Sibley's bird, um, bird guide is, is 
the one that I use the most extensively. And um, I really like it because it shows the birds, um, it, it shows drawings of the birds, which um, some people might think it's helpful to see, you know, actual pictures of birds, photographs, but birds can be varying in color, even within the individual species. Um, there can be lots of variation in color. And so I think Sibley's does, and National Geographic, which is showed there in the middle, uh, those both do a really good job of kind of summarizing, if you will, what the bird looks like. And they can do that by drawing the birds out. And um, the Crosley guide shown on the right, that's a really good guide that shows multiple views of, of birds, so showing them in flight, showing them you know, perched, showing them in, in whatever specific type of habitats they're gonna be in. So um, like I said, there's lots more guides out there, but these are some of my favorites. This is um, a range map that I've pulled off of eBird. And these are really helpful going back to, you know, knowing what birds are available out there before you, you know, even go out in the field. Um, it's helpful looking at eBird, you can pull, this, this is a relatively new thing. They, they have these abundance animation maps. And um, this is one for the palm warbler. And I'll, I'll kind of play it for you. It's a video and you can kind of see the bird's migration as they progress through the year. So I think that's really cool. Um, they have this for most species. You can just Google um, whatever species you're looking for, abundance animation map for eBird, and you should be able to find them. I'll play it one more time. It's, I think it's really neat. Showing them February, March, April. As we move into spring, you can see them move up, spinning the summer, and moving back down in the fall. And so you'll notice over here, it actually gives you um, certain dates. So, um, you can actually tell exactly when, you know, these species are gonna be as they just come into the Quad Cities area. So that's really helpful. It'll let me advance here. All right, so how do you identify an unknown bird? Um, if you're out in the field, you see a bird, you have no idea what you're looking at. Um, it's really helpful to, if you can hear them, I, I like to bird by ear that I can find most of my birds out in the field just by listening to their call. Almost every bird has a different unique type of call. And by knowing some of their calls, um, that's gonna really help you to identify what you're looking at. So um, again, we're gonna play some of the calls of warblers here and I, I hope it'll be helpful. And I'll, I'll give you some tips and tricks on how to um, kind of memorize those types of calls. Um, studying their face. So looking at, if you're looking at birds within a single family, so looking at the warblers, um, they're all gonna have a slightly different face. And I think looking at the face is the first thing you wanna do. Um, and this goes for any bird species. Um, just looking at bill shape and you know just their facial features is just like recognizing another person and once you do it enough once you get enough experience i think you'll find that um, you'll be able to group birds and identify them much better by looking at their face um, placing them in a taxonomic group is another good first step to do so i've got the picture shown here you know is it a duck you're looking at is it a woodpecker is it a heron or a hawk uh, placing them into those groups is going to help you when you go back to your field guide and then go from there go you know you know you've got a hawk in the air but then go to that hawk group in your field guide and, and go from there to figure out what you've got flying size is another good thing size can be tricky though because size is kind of often distorted in the field um, something that's you know you've got the hairy versus downy woodpecker dilemma they they both look really identical they are different sizes but when you're out in the field that's that's really hard to tell unless you have both birds you know right next to each other so i caution people with size but that is something you can use to identify um, habitats a really good one um, you're not going to find you know a shorebird in the middle of a forest kind of thing so um, knowing what kind of habitat you're looking at is also really helpful and then behavior i'm going to be sharing some some identify or some tips about some behaviors that some of these warblers have that are going to help you identify them as well. Uh, coloration is the last thing you want to use. Uh, color like size can be distorted in the field. Um, color is, it, depending on what lighting you have, if the bird's backlit, you know, a bright blue 
indigo bunting might look completely dark um, if it's backlit. So I don't like to use coloration to identify birds. I use all these other things first um, before using color. But um, it is helpful to focus on where the white is on the bird. Um, white isn't going to change depending on the lighting. So if you know, if you can figure out where the white is, when you're looking through pictures on your field guides, you should be able to tell, um, you know, you can match up where those white, where that white is in your pictures in your field guide. So I wanted to talk a little bit first about a bird identif identification app that I use. So this is basically like a, a field guide on your phone. And I use the Sibley Birds app on my phone. I, I use it extensively. It's very helpful. It's helped me to learn a lot about birds. And um, it is, it's a $20 app. I think it's worth every penny. Um, they are onto the second version now. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how, um, what you can find in the application. And this is actually what it looks like when you pull up the app. Um, you can look at birds taxonomically, uh, alphabetically. You can actually set it up to where it's only showing you birds that are in your location. So I have it set to Iowa. And you can tell it to only show me common birds, only show me common and uncommon birds, or you know what are the rare, you can exclude rare birds if you want. Um, you can even tell it, you know, it helps you um, identify birds by, you know, you can tell it, you can tell Sibley's app what, what size bird you saw, or you saw a hawk and it was this big and, and that kind of thing. So it helps you to narrow down kind of what you're looking at. So there are other apps. Uh, Audubon has an application. Some of my colleagues use that and they ha find it really helpful. It is a free app. So I think it's really good um, for, for being a free one. That, that's another one where you can input data. You can say, you know, I saw a green medium-sized bird in a wetland habitat and it'll pull up everything um, that might be that bird um, on the on the app. The warbler guide is another application which I don't have personally but I know people who use it and have found it really helpful and what I think that one's helpful for is it shows you all the warblers and shows you different views of them so kind of like the Crosley ID guide um, it will give you different views. You know, if you only, warblers spend a lot of time up in the treetops. And if you're only looking at the underside, sometimes that can be difficult to identify it. But if you use this guide, this application, you can um, look at those views and then kind of match up what you're seeing. Raptor ID guide um, is, another, is another good one. It's also free. And there's many other ones, but these are some of the ones that I know about. All right, so real quickly, I'll, I'll kind of speed through. This is what the Sibley app would look like um, if you were showing birds taxonomically. We've got all the ducks and geese here. Another really cool thing that the Sibley app does is it shows you um, this, these codes on the left-hand side here. The U stands for uncommon, C for common, S for scarce. And so I'm showing all birds in Iowa set to the month in May. And this is all what comes up. You can scroll down and you know see all the different groups of birds. Um, if you scroll down to the warblers, we've got, you know, oven birds are uncommon, Louisiana water thrushes are scarce, all the way down here is the Nashville warbler is a very common species. So I like that it shows, you know, what's common and what's not common. If you click on the Nashville warbler, this is what it's going to look like. This is just like Sibley's book, their field guide, their, their uh, hard copy. It's, it, like I said, it shows you drawings of the different birds. It'll show you what the male and females will look like, females down here. And, um, you know, it'll give you text and give you different ID and characteristics to look for. Um, you can look at the descriptions of the birds. It'll tell you what the sounds are like, you know, what are, what kind of habitat can you find them in. This is a new thing for their um, volume two application. It shows you Jan all the months of the year, January through December and tells you what months that they're scarce in, common in, uncommon in. So I think that's really helpful um, going back to, you know, knowing what birds are gonna be around before you go out in the field, or even while you're in the field, pulling up this, um, it'll tell you whether or not, you know, the species you're looking at, is it even possible for it to be there during that month that you're looking for it? Gives a range map, and I'll be showing you guys range maps today of all the different warblers and. This is the Nashville's range map. Everything in purple would be year round. Orange is typically a summer or breeding range. Blue is a winter range. And yellow is typically means migration. Grayed out means it's gonna be rare for you to find it in that area. And you can also compare different species. So still we're still in the Nashville warbler here and it's, if I pull up a species comparison, it shows you everything that could look like it. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't always fit. But, um, and it's kind of unfortunate for Nashville, it has so many lookalikes, but I think the more you study these birds, the more, more you realize that there's really 
um, nothing else that looks like a Nashville, but sometimes this, this feature is helpful. All right, so let's jump into the warblers. Um, the first one we're gonna talk about is the oven bird, and I will play you its call first. And before I play it, it the tip to remembering this bird's call is they say, teacher, teacher, teacher. So notice too, when they say teacher, 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 it gets louder as their, their call progresses. So let's go ahead and play it. So the unfortunate thing about that call is it sounds really similar to a Carolina wren. Um, fortunately, those Carolina wrens can do an almost identical call to that, but um, Carolina wrens are kind of known for having a variety of different calls. And I, I guess fortunately, it's they usually do a three-part call, which we call tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. And so I'll play that one really quickly just so you can compare. So that's their tea kettle call. So if you're any time other in the, if you're in the year, um, oven birds are typically only found in May and June and in the migration months. So May, June, August, September. So if you're outside of those months, it's probably a Carolina wren that you're hearing. But you're, if you're within, you know, those migration months, then you maybe want to look a little closer at the oven bird. So these are going to be found in forested areas and these birds tend to hang out on the ground. So you're, you're only really gonna find them low to the ground or maybe perched on a mid-level branch singing. And they have this jerky walking gait and a head bob with their tail raised that's characteristic of them. So um, bird on the ground that's bobbing its head, raising its tail um, could be an oven bird. Look for the racing stripes on top of its head. Notice these two brown stripes and this orange crown on top of their head, very streaked underneath. Um, that's characteristic of the oven bird. So um, they're going to be in Iowa, like I said, during the, the breeding season. They, they can be here all breeding season. And I have been seeing these at Fairmont Cemetery and Sunderbrook Park area. So they are around if you're out looking for them. All right, the Louisiana water thrush looks pretty similar to the oven bird. It's also got this streaking underneath. It's pretty brown on top. But notice the white broad eye eyebrow here. Uh, that's what you're going to want to look for with the Louisiana water thrush. Uh, I'll play their call here. Um, they have kind of a bubbly call and then it kind of reminds me, the way I think of it is it's a bubbly call that falls off the waterfall. So listen for that when you listen to their call. So kind of, kind of bubbly and then falls off the waterfall at the end. So that's a Louisiana water thrush. Um, these also pump their tail and you typically find these around the water's edge. So if you look at the picture here on the right, you can see the water down here. They're in the mud flats and they, they constantly are pumping their, their tails and that's a characteristic uh, behavior that they have. So almost identical to the Louisiana water thrush is the northern water thrush. So these two are notoriously difficult to tell apart. Um, really the only thing you can use to, to tell them apart um, is their eyebrow here in the northern water thrush is gonna be kind of a buffy yellowish color. And um, they do have more dense streaking on their breast, but sometimes that can be hard to tell in the field. And the northern water thrush, it, it can have a white a whiter eye, eyebrow. So these two are really difficult to tell apart. Um, if you can get them to call, that's gonna be the best thing to tell them apart. So I'll play its call here. Almost more of a, more of a chirping that kind of falls off. And um, so it's much different call from the Louisiana water thrush. And that's kind of the best way to tell them apart. Um, these are found in migration. I've been seeing lots of these in Nahant Marsh. So if you're out and about, maybe around the bird blind area, I've actually seen them, if you're looking out of the bird blind, right down on that mud flat in front of it, I've been seeing lots of these northern water thrushes. So really good spot to find them. All right. So here's a comparison of the two. Um, I took this from Thayer's bird software. So I didn't talk about this earlier, but that's this is another really good resource to use to 
uh, study birds or compare them. Uh, there's bird software. You can actually get your own quizzes in there and you can listen to their calls. You can look at different views of the birds. You can look at their range maps and all that good stuff. And uh, you can actually compare between species. And so this is a photo um, comparing these two. And you can tell the Louisiana water thrush has that white eye line and the northern water thrush has that buffy eyebrow. The golden wing warbler. Um, this one is relatively uncommon. Uh, we do find it in May, August, September. Those are gonna be about the only months that we're gonna find it. Um, these are gonna be ones that hang out high in the tree canopy. And you'll find that most warblers, are, most warblers like to hang out high up in the trees. That's kind of what it makes it difficult to see them and ID them uh, because they're up so high. So binoculars are definitely in order um, if you're out looking for warblers. But uh, this is the golden winged, gets its name from the gold in its wing. And um, it's also got gold on its crown and it's got black auriculars, which is another name kind of for its ears um, behind the eye and then a black throat. And so um, they have kind of a buzz, buzz, buzz call. So I'll play that real quick. So buzz, 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 buzz. That's the golden ring, golden winged warbler. Nothing else really sounds like that. There's other warblers that do buzz, but not not in that cadence. And so um, you can find them in brushy forests. And like I said, they hang out high up in the treetops. Um, so they are kind of similar. Um, you be careful of with the black-throated green warbler. The black-throated greens do have a black throat and some uh, yellow on the head. We'll go over black-throated greens later, um, but keep on keep a lookout for that. Um, the the gold on the crown and the gold in the wings. Also, you could compare those to um, uh, yellow rump warblers, which we'll talk about later. But yellow rump warblers have the yellow kind of in the armpit area, not on the wings. So. This is the blue winged warbler, closely related to the golden winged warbler. Um, gets its name from the blue wings that it has and has a mostly yellowish um, body, a very dark thin eye line. So that's characteristic of this bird. There's other birds that are all yellow or at least have yellow heads and yellow breasts, but look for that dark eye line that goes through its eye. And then the, of course the blue wings on this one. Um, these also have a buzz call, but it's it's very different from the golden wing warbler. So I'll play that quickly. Buzz, buzz. All right, so that's the blue wing warbler. Um, we do have those in the Brini area. I've seen a handful of these around. Um, I've, I heard about, you know, a couple of them in Sunderbrook Park area. And uh, so they are around and you can't find them. Again, these like to hang out in the treetops, uh, forested edges and up in the canopy and uh, those kinds of places. All right, the black and white warbler, very uh, com relatively common to uncommon migrant. Um, only have these during the migration months. Um, you can see Iowa is kind of in the yellow there on the range map. Um, they like to mature deciduous forest or mixed forest. Um, but definitely forested areas. Um, these guys, they'll forage like a nuthatch. So that's kind of a characteristic behavior that they have. Um, they'll, you'll kind of find them along large branches or tree trunks like, a, like, you, like you would find a nuthatch. And so if you see a bird acting like a nuthatch and looks like a zebra, one of my colleagues, uh, I called this bird the zebra bird. So that's, um, I guess, a good way of thinking about it. It's completely black and white and Although there are other black and white warblers um, that have black and white in them, this is the one, the only one that's completely black and white and has that uh, white eyebrow and black lines on the, on the belly and the, and the head. So uh, I'll play its call really quickly. Its call is really easy to identify. I think um, it sounds like a squeaky wheel revolving. So listen for that when you hear it. So kind of a squeaky wheel. So pretty easy call, I think, in my opinion. All right, the prothonotary warbler. 
Uh, this one's uncommon. Um, we get it in late spring, it starts showing up. We, I've seen one of these at Nahant Marsh recently, so they are here. And we can't find them all summer, although they, they kind of aren't as common throughout the summer months, but we do have them. And another name for these is the golden swamp warbler uh, because they like to hang out in um, swampy areas. So marshy type areas with, they stay low in the understory. Um, their call is, it's kind of like a sweet, 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 sweet. So I'll play it quick. Kind of a monotonous, sweet, 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 sweet. And um, pretty easy to identify. I think they're all yellow, um, except for the wings, these dark gray, um, dark grayish blue and um, wings and tail. Um, watch out comparing these to the yellow warbler, which we'll cover soon. The yellow warbler is all yellow, including the wings and tail. And the yellow warbler will have red lines on the front. Um, blue winged warbler, you might confuse this with the blue winged warbler that we just looked at, but notice that it doesn't have that blight, black eye line going through its eye. Uh, the prothonotary is completely yellow golden on its head. All right, the Nashville warbler, very, very common warbler that we have. I've been seeing lots of these um, since early spring. Um, these guys, they have a grayish head with a, a yellow underside, yellow chin, and yellow belly. Um, characteristic of these guys is the white eye line or the white eye ring. And um, they, I think they're pretty easy to identify. If you just look for a yellow warbler with a completely gray head with that white eye ring, I don't think you can go wrong. Um, these guys, they have kind of a musical type of song with kind of a trill at the end. So I'll play it. So musical with a trill at the end. Um, we only have these really in migration, and I think they're more common in the spring migration. Um, they become un uncommon or scarce in the fall. Um, but they are, um, I guess you could compare them. There's a, a, warb a couple warblers that we're not going to cover today, but just to give you a heads up, there are a couple that kind of look like this. The Connecticut warbler um, is is similar, but it's it's a pretty rare bird for our area, so I normally don't consider that one. And the morning warbler, which is like the morning dove, M-O-U-R-N, morning, um, it has no eye ring. So if, if you're looking for that white eye ring, you really can't go wrong with the Nashville warbler. This is the common yellow throat, also another very common warbler as suggested by its name. Um, I always get, you know, people always say, you know, why do they call it the yellow throat warbler? Because we do have a yellow throated warbler. Um, and I guess these guys do have a yellow throat, but they have a black face mask. And so I often hear people joking, you know, why, don't, why isn't this called the, the raccoon, raccoon warbler or the black mast warbler or something like that? Um, because this is telltale characteristic of the common yellow throat is that black face mask. Um, these are also found in marshy types habitat, weedy, brushy, marshy, low wet areas is where you're gonna find this one. And it tends to hang out um, low in the brush, low in the weeds. Uh, its song is really easy to identify. It's, it's, they say, witchity, witchity, witchity. Very secretive birds, um, no neck at all. And oftentimes they will raise their head or raise their tail, sorry. And uh, we can't find these throughout the breeding season in our area. So very common warbler. Um, if you want to compare it to something I don't think there's really anything else that looks much like it. Maybe the Kentucky Warbler, which we're not going to cover today. It has a little bit of black in the face, but like I said, nothing really looks quite like the common yellow throat. The American Red Start. Um, also, I'd say a relatively common to uncommon um, warbler. We'll have these from May through September. Um, these guys are really cool. They're, they're kind of fidgety, high energy birds. Um, find them up in the canopy in sort of mid-level forested areas, um, hanging out on the forest edges and things like that. Um, they have a characteristic behavior where they'll flick their tail up. They'll fan their tail out and they'll flick it up and they, they do that to chase insects around and they, they do um, fly around and catch insects. Um, they have probably one of the most complex calls of, of any of the warblers 
and they have variable calls too. So they can change it up. They can, you know, have different types of calls. It makes them really difficult to um, identify them by call, but with enough, enough experience, I think you could get the, you know, the gist of it. So notice how that was two parts to their call. They, they often do that, that's something, um, they have one type of call and then they'll switch it to another type of call right afterwards. And you can identify them, they're, um, at least the males, um, they're lots of black in them. They have these reddish orange color in their wings, in their armpits and on the edges of their tails. The females will look like that too, but it'll be more of a yellowish color and they're more drab, not as black. Um, so I don't think there's much else that really looks like the American Red Star. You could probably confuse the females um, with some other types of warblers, but I think the male is really um, hard to, you know, hard to mess up. All right, the Cape May Warbler. This one's an uncommon warbler that we have in May pretty much only in May. Um, we can find them in September, but um, it is a migrant that goes through Iowa. Um, their song is a seat, 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 really, really high pitched. So extremely high pitched seat, 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 seat. And they can be found in carnivorous forests. So those evergreen forests, especially up north. Um, in migration though, you can find them on any kind of flowering tree. And these ones will drink, they'll actually drink ne nectar out of the flowers. Um, nothing really to, to say about their behavior, except I do know that they are territorial birds and they'll kind of defend the flowers that they're eating on. So they can be territorial. Um, as far as identification goes, uh, look for the black streaks, uh, lots of yellow in the head and in the breast and black streaks along the sides. Um, they've got this sort of rufous rusty color um, kind of cheeks or auriculars, which is another name for the, those um, ears. And so nothing else really has that. Um, I, I don't think you could really confuse this with any kind of other warbler, so. All right, the Northern Perula. Um, an uncommon warbler found May through September. Uh, these guys are really hard to see uh, by sight because they, they tend to hang out, you know, at the tippy tops of the trees up in the canopy and they'll stay up in there and they'll sing, you know, sing their hearts out, but they're, they're really hard to get to come down to get a good look at them. Um, their song is pretty easy to identify though. Um, you can hear them calling. Their, their song is kind of an escalating buzzy trill that falls off at the end. So I'll play that quick. So escalating trail falls off at the end. Um, you can find these in any type of wood, wooded areas in migration. And um, they kind of have an interesting behavior, in, at least in their breeding range. Um, they, can, they nest in hanging moss, kind of like an oriole mite. And um, like I said, they're found high up in the trees. As far as coloration goes, they, um, it's characteristic of perulas to have this yellow that goes into the chin and up into the lower mandible. No, no other birds really have that. So if you see a yellow chin into the yellow bill, um, probably in northern Perula. They have these white eye arcs, so white on the top and bottoms of their eyes, and they're kind of a, a blue, bluish gray on their backs. And I have been seeing these around, so they're, they're not hard to find in our area, especially during migration. All right, the Magnolia Warbler. Um, this one sounds, their song goes sweet, sweeter, sweetest. So I'll play it real quick. So kind of a three part little call there. Um, you can find them in any type of woods. It is a migrating bird. Um, we can find them in May and September. Um, I have seen one at Fairmont Cemetery um, and one of my colleagues found one not too long ago. So they are on their way um, up north. And they're pretty easy to identify. I think this is the male. They have a black necklace from which all these black streaks come down um, from that black part on their on their neck. And they do have a black mask on their on their face and some white 
in the wings and just over the eye, uh, but nothing else really looks like that um, to me. So that's the Cape May warbler. The black Bernian warbler, um, one of my favorites. They have a flaming red, flaming orange throat, um, and they do have some streaking down the sides. Um, but in the right lighting, you you can't go, you can't mistake that. The, the black Bernian has a you know magnificent orange throat and um, head. And I have found these. They are, um, I'd say, they're relatively uncommon, but we can find them in the migration areas in May and even in the fall, August, September. Um, I found one of these in my front, in the front tree of my yard actually just a couple days ago, and uh, they have a very high pitch call. It actually kind of reminds me of a red start call, um, very high pitched. I'll play it, play it for you. So almost a two part kind of call, uh, very high pitched though. Find them in any, any types of woods. Uh, they're not called the wood warblers for nothing. They're a lot of these these guys. You have to find them in forested areas. Um, again, these like to hang out in the treetops, although they will come down sometimes. And um, look for the look for the bright orange throat. If you have bad lighting, I suppose look for the black um, black auriculars. And um, they do have some white in the wing, so they have this pretty big white patch on their coverts here in the wing. So you could look for that as well. All right, the yellow warbler. Uh, this is a really common warbler. I, I heard one singing just this morning at Nayant Marsh. Uh, very bright yellow birds with reddish streaks down the belly. Uh, very cool looking warblers. Uh, we will have them during the, the breeding season. Um, so they're, they're really common early in, in spring, but we'll have them all the way to into fall. Um, you can find them in wet, brushy type areas. Uh, they like to hang out in willow thickets and that type of thing. Um, nothing to say in, in regards to their behavior. Uh, they're kind of just like every other warbler. Um, the bright yellow, like I said, with those red streaks is how you identify these. Um, even with bad lighting, I think that, that yellow really sticks out. So I guess be careful comparing it to the prothonotary. But like I said, this bird is all yellow. The prothonotary is going to have the grayish blue wings and tail. Their song is a sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. So if you can memorize that call, you'll hear these guys everywhere. They're, they're pretty common warbler. All right, chestnut-sided warblers. I've seen a couple of these in the Fairmont area, uh, Sunderbrook Park area. Um, just like the name suggests, they have these chestnut colored brown edges on their, on their sides there. Uh, they do have a yellow crown and some black around the eye and almost like a black handlebar mustache. Um, they have a, a musical, the, the best way to describe their call is kind of a musical call with a sneeze at the end, kind of an achoo. I actually think I have the wrong call in there. Um, so I think that actually might be the Cape May or it could be another call. They, they do have different calls. so. Um, let's we'll see if I can try that again. You hear the a chew at the end, the, so a musical with an a chew at the end, the sneeze. That's how I remember it. So hopefully that's helpful. But um, all white belly into the white chin, uh, yellow yellow cap. Pretty much only find these in migration. So that's the chestnut side of warbler. All right, the palm warbler, another really common warbler. We've been seeing gobs of these at Nahant Marsh. Um, the best way to tell these is if you can find a small warbler shaped bird uh, with a rufous crown and a, a bird that's constantly pumping its tail, kind of like the water thrushes, although these don't hang out on the ground as much. Um, but you do find them in wetland type area, marshy type area. Um, but like I said, they're, they're constantly pumping their tail. So if you see a bird doing that, it's, it's a good chance it could be the palm warbler. But they have this yellow throat and a yellow eyebrow with that rufous crown. Um, they have kind of a buzzy, um, trill-like call. It, it reminds me a lot of a chipping sparrow. Um, but they don't call as frequently as, as chipping sparrows do.
so almost insect like kind of that trill. Um, but like I said, it sounds a lot like a chipping sparrow, but they don't call nearly as frequently. Um, so yeah, we will have these all the way through migration, but I, there's no trouble finding these, especially at Nahant Marsh and, and other types of wetland areas. Yellow rumped warbler, another really common warbler species, um, gets their name from the yellow in the rump, the yellow butt that they have there. And another name for these birds, you might've heard them called butter butts. Um, and they, yeah, they have that yellow in the rump. They can hide that a little bit sometimes, so it's, I don't always go by that. But like I said, they have earlier, they had these yellow armpits and they do have yellow on the crown too. I showed you this picture over here. Um, they can have yellow in the crown. So don't confuse them with like a golden crown kinglet or anything like that. But they are, um, have these black streaking down their breast and black streaking down their back. And they have a black face mask as well with a white throat. Um, a subspecies of this, the Audubon's yellow run warbler is gonna have a yellow throat. Uh, but I believe we only have the myrtle yellow run warblers around here and they're gonna have a white throat. And uh, these are gonna be one of the earliest migrants that we get, the earliest ones to show up in the spring and the last ones to leave in the fall. Um, so you, we can find them all throughout the summer though. And uh, their call, kind of a complex call. Um, I'll play it for you here. So not really sure. I don't have any good tips on how to remember that one. It's kind of a kind of a tricky one, but and they, they also have a variable call. So they, they can do different types of calls. They also have kind of a warbling type of call. You probably notice that a lot of these warblers, they don't actually warble. A lot of them, they have completely different calls and much variability in their songs. So All right, I think we only have a couple left here. So yellow-throated warbler, um, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, I, I just think they're really gorgeous. They have this really bright yellow throat into their chest and the black face mask with a couple black stripes down either side of their belly there. Um, they have kind of a bubbly call, bubbly, bubbly and up. And the, the call kind of goes up in pitch. It's somewhat similar to the um, Louisiana water thrush but remember the Louisiana water thrush kind of falls off the waterfall at the end. Um, the yellow-throated warbler goes up in pitch. I'll play the Louisiana for you just to compare. So that's one version. The Louisiana water thrush can do a much similar call to the yellow-throated warbler, um, but like I said, you always look, listen for the the fall in pitch for the Louisiana water thrush, and the rise in pitch for the yellow-throated warbler. Um, you can't really mistake these with anything else. Um, you might, you know, you might compare um, with the black Bernian warbler, I suppose, but um, black Bernian is going to have color all the way into the head. And uh, there's really not much, I don't really think you'll have much trouble comparing this one to other species. So um, we do have them into the breeding season. Uh, they're relatively uncommon in May, but we can find them in the summertime as well. All right, last but not least, the black-throated green warbler. Uh, I've been seeing lots of these in the Fairmont Cemetery area and Sunderbrook Park area. And their call is extremely easy to memorize. Um, in my opinion, they, they say Z, 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 Z. Z, 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 Z. They also have a different type of call, which sounds really similar, but for this one, they um, say trees, trees, murmuring trees. Trees, trees, murmuring trees. So really easy to remember their call. Um, very contrasting black throat with a colored head, um, yellowish head. And it's really hard to tell. You have to have the perfect lighting to actually see any green in their back. Um, but they do have kind of a greenish wash uh, to their back, which gives them their name. And you can't really confuse them with anything else. Maybe the Townsend's warbler, but that's a very rare warbler. I, it, you'd be really lucky to find that one in our area. So 
um, I don't think you'll have any you know, trouble comparing or confusing this one with any other warbler species. So um, if anyone wants to jump in on the chat, I've got a, a challenge for you. If this is a warbler that we talked about and it is a female, anyone cared to guess um, what picture we showed on the, you know, the title of our webinar posting? I'd be interested to see what, what folks guess for this one. But otherwise, I'm open to questions if, if folks have questions and be happy to answer them. So Jimmy, we do have um, a couple of questions here. One is, um, they wanna know if there's an app that can record a call heard while birding um, to help identify what you're hearing. Um, I'm not for sure on that. I think there is. I seem to recall hearing uh, something like that. Um, I don't know if iNaturalist, if they take in sound recordings, and I don't know, maybe you'd be able to answer that, Amy, but um, that's the one, one app that comes to mind is maybe um, iNaturalist might be able to do that. Um, but what I've done when I learn my own bird calls, I oftentimes, I don't hesitate to record calls in the field. And then I'll compare those recordings that I've recorded myself to um, say using the Sibley app, the Sibley bird application, and looking up calls and just comparing, comparing those that way, I think is really helpful. That's, that's how I've kind of learned a lot of my calls is by doing that. Okay, another question is, how can we attract warblers to our bird feeders? Um, really, I don't know that there's much you can do to attract a warbler to your feeder. Um, there, a lot of them are insect eaters and they're not really, they do eat seeds as well, but they're, they're not typically, you know, feeder, bird feeder type birds. They, they're more gonna be found deep in forest on forested edges. If you have that type of habitat, you might get lucky, you know, and get some, um, especially more of the common ones, maybe like yellow rump warbler and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I think it'd be pretty difficult to kind of attract them to a simple um, seed feeder. And I don't know, maybe other folks have had luck doing that, but I certainly haven't. Okay, and then we have a few guesses for um, your bird challenge there. One was um, Butterbutt, so the yellow rumped warbler. That is correct. So kudos uh -huh. to whoever guessed that. Um, and just so folks know, the kind of the way you tell it with this one is the yellow in the armpits. Um, and there's no, other birds can have that yellow in the armpit, but there's no yellow in the wing. And so, Yep, that is a butter butt. Okay, another question here. Um, what's the best way to identify them when they're in the trees? Do you watch for flight patterns the most or do you try to view them through binoculars? Definitely through binoculars. Um, I don't think there's any characteristic uh, flight patterns to the warblers. They're all kind of fidgety, very high energy birds that don't sit still very long. So you've gotta be good with your binoculars and I always tell people, it's actually kind of fortunate that they're fidgety birds because that's how you can see them, you know, a tiny little bird flittering around at the treetops. And so I always tell people to find the target first, find the bird, lock your eyes on it, and then bring your binoculars up to your eyes and the bird should be in, in view. You might have to adjust your focus a little bit, but if you can find the bird first and lock your eyes on it and don't move your head, bring your binoculars up to your eyes, it should be right there. And uh, of course, you're going to have to move around a lot because these birds don't sit still. But um, there's some birds like behavior patterns, you can tell them. So like the Louisiana water thrushes that are constantly pumping themselves, but you find those on the ground near the water. Uh, palm warblers are kind of mid-level birds. Um, again, they, they pump their tails. And so you can use behavior for some of them. The American red starts, again, they f stick up their tail and fan it out. So you can sometimes use behavior. But for the most part, you're going to want to look for a small fidgety bird high up in the trees and try to get your binoculars on it.
All right, we'll give uh, just a little a moment here if there are any other questions. So there were there was a question about when the birding dates are. Yep, so the last Saturday in May is gonna be the first one and we'll start at eight o'clock a.m. at Nahant Marsh. Um, and it's gonna, we're gonna have them every Saturday thereafter all the way through June from eight o'clock to 10 o'clock um, or thereabouts. Folks don't have to stay that long, um, but it will start at eight o'clock at Nahant Marsh. And um, we may end up going into July for those um, that remains to be determined. But for right now, we're definitely gonna be doing them every Saturday starting the last Saturday in May and all Saturdays in June. So I hope you guys can join me for that. I definitely wanna show up at least for the last one in May because um, it's gonna be getting close to you know the warblers finishing up their migrations. So I think last year around the end of May, uh, we found 26 warblers in one day at Fairmont Cemetery. So um, I'm hoping to have that good of luck this year, we'll see, but. Okay, it looks like we have um, a few people who are trying to ask some questions here. So give me just a moment. Extra bonus points for anyone who can tell me what this bird is on the question slide. It's actually not a warbler. All right, so we've got um, a few questions here. Um, is there a good place in the cemetery to bird or just anywhere in the cemetery? Pretty much anywhere um, in the cemetery, especially you know during peak migration. Um, we found warblers all over the place in there. And uh, if you're closer to the forest edges, those are good spots to look for things like thrushes and other types of wood thrushes, Swainson's thrushes, gray cheek thrushes, veeries, those types of birds. Oven birds are really good to find like on the forested edges because they like to hang out near the ground. But really any treetops all the way through Fairmont Cemetery or Sunderbrook, uh, Nahant Marsh is really good. We found some really good warblers there as well. Um, and at Nahant Marsh you're more likely to find, you know, the palm warblers and water thrushes and yellow warblers, prothonotary warblers, that kind of thing. So they want to know where is Fairmont Cemetery at? Fairmont Cemetery is down by Nahant Marsh. It's right off of Rockingham Road, um, right right down by Nahant, um, just a, you know, a few miles from us. So if you're on the Davenport, the Iowa side, uh, get your, if you can get on Rockingham Road and head kind of towards Buffalo, um, that you'll find it down there. It's, it's kind of, if you know where the old Tasty Freeze used to be, it's, it's right like adjacent to that. Um, yeah, was there another question or was that, was that it? I think that is all the questions. Um, we do have a guess for the um, bird pictured there. The, is it a blue gray gnat catcher? You got it, blue gray gnat catcher. So these I suppose could be confused with warblers. They're very, also very fidgety, high energy birds that like to hang out on the treetops. Um, but yep, this is a blue gray gnat catcher. And then there was a question about, is there a good book to teach bird teachings? Teach bird what? Um, just a good bird to, a good book to teach bird. You cut out one more time. 
So they're looking for a book that is good um, to teach birding techniques. Oh, birding techniques. Yeah. Um, so uh, David Allen Sibley, uh, who I mentioned earlier, ha who has a um, field guide, also wrote a book um, on birding, which I'm blinking on the title right now. Uh, but if you just Google Sibley, S-I-B-L-E-Y, and then, you know, bird identification or, you know, um, how to identify birds, I'm certain you'll find find his book. He he wrote a book on how to be a better birder and, you know, what kind of things you can do to increase your birding um, knowledge and your, um, you know, getting better at, at being in the field and identifying. All right, and I think we've Last question, um, what time of day is best to look for warblers? I would definitely say sunrise. Um, earlier, so all birds, warblers included, have, um, they tend to sing, they call it the sun, sunrise, you know, chorus. And you're gonna hear much more birds the closer you are to sunrise um, than anything. So if you're looking, to identify by sound, which is a really good way to, you know, find birds. Um, being there early in the morning is best. Um, warblers and other birds as well tend to stop calling as the day progresses. And there's some exceptions to that, but uh, for the most part, I think early morning is best. But that's not to say, you know, you can't find them throughout the rest of the day. Um, I've I found, you know, a Wilson's warbler late in the day. The black burning warbler I found in my front yard was late afternoon. So, and he was calling too. So, um, especially during migration, um, I think any time of day you can, you can find them, but morning probably is best. All right, I think that's all the questions that we have. So thank you all for tuning in today. And we will have another webinar on nests and eggs that will be next Thursday at 10 a.m. So we look forward to seeing you then. And um, Keep looking at Facebook and your emails for updates on other upcoming webinars and programs.